I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, this is an excellent venue, and everyone is incredibly organized, and like the matching <laughs> jumpsuits are the best idea I've ever seen in my life. This is fantastic. Uh, before we get started, though, important first order of business is there has to be a crowd selfie. So I can't get the whole crowd, so this side of the room gets the privilege. Uh, look like you're happy and you just enjoy to talk and you ha don't know who the hell I am. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, so, uh, cameras, can I move around? Is that okay? Excellent. Cool. Because I like moving around. Because I'm nervous as hell. You'd think that I do this all the time. Shouldn't be too nervous. Anyway. Uh, hi, I'm Laurie Voss. I'm the COO and co-founder of NPM Inc. Uh, and my job title right now is COO, but don't take it too seriously. They just needed to give me a title because I'm a co-founder and that one happened to be available. Um, what I am is a web developer. I've been a web developer for 22 years and that's what I think about and that's what I care about. And that's sort of what I'm talking about today. Uh, I'm talking about NPM and the future of JavaScript. Those two things are closely related these days because where JavaScript goes affects what NPM does. And these days, what NPM does kind of affects what JavaScript does. So this talk is going to have three parts. First, I'm going to tell you uh, what you should know about NPM. Uh, there's a bunch of essential NPM features, some of which are pretty new. And a lot of people haven't heard about them yet, so I'm just going to go through them quickly. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you what NPM knows about you. Uh, we do a lot of research, we have a lot of data, we do a bunch of surveys, we know stuff about JavaScript developers that JavaScript developers don't necessarily know about themselves. So, uh, it's hard to know if you're a JavaScript developer if something is genuinely popular or if there's something is just getting a ton of hype. Uh, and we know, so we can tell you, and that should help you make some technical choices. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the future of JavaScript, which is a very dangerous thing to do, because who the hell would have thought five years ago that this is where we would be today? Uh, but nevertheless, I'm going to go out on a limb and make some predictions uh, to try and help you make technical decisions about what is going to happen in the near future with JavaScript. So let's get started. The first thing that you should know about NPM uh, is that these days, NPM is ridiculously popular. NPM has more than 10 million users, and they download nearly 6 billion packages a week. Uh, we think about 85% of all the people who write JavaScript are already using NPM. Uh, and that is rising rapidly to 100%. Like, it's, you know, there's always going to be a couple holdouts, but at this point, nearly everybody who's using JavaScript is using NPM to do it. Um, and that's even more amazing, because by some measures, JavaScript is the most popular programming language in the world right now. Uh, it is the biggest language on GitHub by a long way, um, and it is, uh, and 70 percent of people in Stack Overflow's survey of developers this year said that they program in JavaScript. So if you put those two numbers together and you believe those numbers, which is not, you might not necessarily, that means something like over 50 percent of all working programmers use NPM today. So. The next thing is that NPM is being used everywhere JavaScript is being used, and JavaScript is being used everywhere. People are building websites in JavaScript, obviously. Uh, they're also building server-side uh, applications in Node. Uh, but people are doing like robotics and IoT in JavaScript, because it turns out that JavaScript's just kind of easy to do. Um, and all of these people are using NPM to do it. All of those fields have, have uh, NPM in them as well, which is why NPM's growth is so big, because it's not just like the growth of web development or the growth of Node. It's the growth of that and robotics and you know, every other framework that happens in JavaScript. These all contribute to this ridiculous amount of growth at NPM. So NPM is the package manager for all of JavaScript. But above all, NPM is for web developers. 93% of NPM users say that they are writing code for the browser. 70% of them also say that they are writing code for the server. So it's not like it's entirely a web browser thing. But that's, that is a huge shift in how we think about ourselves. NPM, you know, the N and the P and the M, they stood for Node Package Manager. Don't ask Isaac. Um, but like, that's what we thought of ourselves when we started the company, and that's not what we are now. NPM is the way that people put websites together, and we've had to change how we think about ourselves, and we've had to change how NPM works to reflect that. 97% um, of the code in a modern web app is downloaded from NPM. 
You, as the application developer, only write the final 3%. All of the interesting parts are the final 3%. And all of this other giant pyramid of stuff that you're standing on top of comes from NPM. The current version of NPM is 6. If you are still on version 3 or 4, which 40% of you are, then you are woefully behind the times. It is time to upgrade. Those are the instructions. It will take you 30 seconds. Well, it won't take you 30 seconds if you're using version 3. It'll take you like five minutes. Don't do it right now, though, because I'm using the Wi-Fi. <laughs> the big reason to move to version 6 of NPM is that version 6 of NPM is 20 times faster than version 4 was. That is not a typo. It is 20 times faster. If your build takes 20 minutes right now, it will take 30 seconds using NPM 6. You should really try that out. Uh, is it faster than Yarn? Yes, it's faster than Yarn. Um, <laughs> or more accurately, uh, all of the package managers are about the same speed now because of a triumph of how open source works. Um, the makers of PNPM and Yarn and NPM, they all got together uh, and they created an online community so that they could talk about building package managers, which it turns out quite a few people are doing. And that place is called package.community, which is a URL these days because it's 2018. Um, and the result was that all of these package manager makers cooperating with each other, uh, they made all package managers faster, but they made them all faster by roughly the same amount. So now they're all basically the same speed. They're all much faster than they used to be, but they're all about the same speed. Uh, sometimes NPM is a little faster, sometimes Yarn is a little faster, but it's never so much faster than you'd notice anymore. Um, but being faster is probably the least exciting thing to happen in NPM recently. The biggest change is that NPM 6 locks by default. That was one of the big features people liked about Yarn, and it is a good idea because you all have trees that have an average of 1,000 modules each in them. And so the semver drift in 1,000 modules is pretty huge. So you want to lock it down and make sure that what you've got on your development environment is exactly what gets deployed to production. And that is what package lock does, and it just happens by default, and you don't need to think about it. Um, another small change, but a nice one, is that you don't have to type dash dash save anymore. If you just npm install something, it's automatically saved into your project because you were installing it. You probably wanted to keep it. If you didn't want it, you can uninstall it. I don't know why that wasn't the default the whole time. <laughs> npm 6 also introduces something called npm CI. Um, this is an alternative way of calling npm install that works particularly well in continuous integration environments. Continuous integration environments have some specific features that meant that we could throw out a bunch of logic that existed in normal npm installs, and the result is that npm CI is twice as fast as a normal npm install. So if you were using, you know, if you're upgrading from npm 4 and you're using npm 6 and you run npm CI, it was 20 times faster, and then it got twice as fast again, so it's 40 times faster. So you should really be getting on that, is what I'm saying. So, as NPM has got bigger, security has become an even bigger concern for us. Um, earlier this year, NPM acquired Lyft Security. That was new. We've never acquired anybody before. That felt like a grown-up grown company thing to be doing. Um, and the first thing that we did was incorporate the Node Security platform directly into, into NPM itself. And the result has been a bunch of new features that we're super happy with. Uh, the first of our security features is two-factor auth. Two-factor auth is important for everyone, but it is especially important for package authors. Uh, if you publish a package, you can set it so that it can be published with 2FA and only with 2FA so that you know that even if somebody steals your credentials, nobody can pretend to be you and publish a malicious package while pretending to be you, which we're going to talk about more later because you're thinking of a specific package right now. <laughs> uh, in May, we launched uh, quick audits. Um, when you download and run, uh, and when you run npm install and you download a bunch of packages, these days you will automatically get a bunch of messages on your console that will tell you whether or not the packages that you are installing are secure. At the moment, we decided that we're not going to stop you installing insecure packages because there's some sort of line to be drawn between convenience and security, but eventually we should probably do that, right? Like if we know you're installing something that's broken, we probably should stop you. Um, this works in nearly every version of NPM, but in NPM 6, the security warnings are going to be more detailed and more useful. Uh, these quick audits, obviously, because they're happening by default, they're happening a lot, and they're turning out to be super popular. We do about 3.5 million quick audits every week. Um, 
The stats around these audits are not great right now. 11% uh, of the scans that we run reveal that somebody is installing packages that have a critical vulnerability in them. That is the kind where you're supposed to drop everything and fix it immediately. Uh, and 37% of them have a high vulnerability. We don't necessarily know if you're installing a package with a high vulnerability that your code is vulnerable. So don't run into Twitter and go like, oh, 37% of, of web apps are vulnerable. No. 37% of web apps are using a package that has a high vulnerability in it. They might not be using it in an insecure way. Uh, but if they're using ones with the critical vulnerability in them, it's hard to use them in a non-dangerous way. Those 11%, those people are probably in trouble, and we should talk to them. Um, but fortunately, fixing all of that stuff just got a lot easier, uh, because running NPM audit will give you a detailed report about your web app, uh, of the vulnerabilities that exist in your app, uh, and how severe they are, and often what to do about them. Um, and often the answer when you, when you need to tell somebody how to fix their insecure web app is you just tell them you should upgrade from this insecure version that you're using to the secure version. Because generally, by the time that somebody has reported an insecure version of a, of a, a package, that's because they found out about it, and so they fix it. So nearly all insecure packages have a secure version that you can upgrade to. And the way that you do that is run NPM. So if NPM is the thing telling you to run NPM, why doesn't NPM just run itself and fix it for you? That's exactly what it does now. NPM audit fix, not only will it download and install all your packages for you and tell you if they're insecure, you will fix them for you if it turns out that they are insecure. It will just magically get that right. It is amazing. I don't know when we turned from being like a thing that downloads stuff and puts it on your hard drive to, for you to a thing that fixes your software for you, but you're welcome. <laughs> uh, by default, it will only bring in uh, Semver compatible changes. So it will bring in stuff that it thinks doesn't break your software, but you shouldn't trust us. You should be running your tests anyway. Uh, but if there are breaking changes that come in, you can force it to bring in the breaking changes as well with dash dash force. Then you should definitely be running your tests because it is definitely going to break you. But it's better to be secure than broken, right? Uh, Another big change in NPM recently is that we shut down our GitHub tracker. Um, NPM is one of the world's largest open source projects. And while we love GitHub, the issue tracker was just not scaling to meet our needs. It was becoming kind of a vortex of sadness where people would throw issues and we couldn't find them because there were 10,000 of those bastards and there was nothing we could do. Uh, so now we have a discourse. There's npm.community, which is also a URL because 2018. Uh, it's sort of a combination of an issue tracker and a forum. Uh, you can sort of help each other, and you can also see what feature development is being done, and you can track where progress is going, and it's, in general, just like a million times better than using GitHub issues for this kind of thing. So you should all have it head over there and check it out. Another new NPM feature in NPM 6 is NPX. This is a convenient little sort of side program that lets you uh, run any command on the registry as if it was already installed on your computer without you having to download and install it. This is super useful for commands that you just use once in a while and that you would not need to, that you don't want hanging around on your computer all the time. Uh, so you can do like npx create react app and it will download and install create react app, it will run react app, it will create a react app for you and then it will tidally delete itself and vanish back into the ether, leaving you with only a react app and not this annoying tool hanging around. Um, NPX has a ton of features. I've given a whole talk that is just about the stuff that you can do with NPX. Uh, so you should absolutely check it out. As you can tell, I could go on and on and on about all the features of NPM because I work on it all day and we're super happy with it. Uh, there are a few quick ones I didn't mention. You can get your own scope for free. You can get an open source organization for free. You, can use, you should be using run scripts to save you time. And you can use NPM init to standardize your application setup. If you're not familiar with any of those things, now's the time to Google them. But I'm not going to talk about them today. Uh, but the one last thing I am going to talk about, uh, because people keep asking, is how does NPM make money? Are you some kind of charity? Like, we had a super fan who came to visit us the other day, and like, he is a super fan. Like, he follows us on Twitter and is constantly up in our Instagram. Why do we have an Instagram? He's like, he loves us. And like, one of his first questions was like, wow, this office is really nice. How does a charity afford this? And I'm like, oh, come on. No, we're a company. Uh, the registry costs millions of dollars a year just to keep up and running, just the servers and bandwidth. Um, so we are a company because only a company could generate enough revenue to keep the registry going and growing the way that it does. So we, uh, 
Uh, we earn money by selling ser services and, and goods that people like, uh, like private packages and security services, and you should really look into them if you haven't used them. This talk is not going to be about plugging them. So it's time to move on to what NPM knows about you. First off, how do we know all of this stuff in the first place? There are two big ways. First, every time you download stuff from NPM, you hit our servers and you, you, know, you request stuff from us. So we know what computer you're coming from and what operating system you are on and what version of Node and what version of NPM and what packages you are downloading because that's what you were doing. Uh, and we also just asked you directly. We ran a survey at the end of last year. We asked 16,000 people what, they, uh, what they're doing with JavaScript and how they feel about NPM and a whole bunch of other stuff. And they just told us, because you're all nice, uh, and 16,000 responses to a survey gets some very interesting data. I don't know how much you care about data, but I care about data. And getting an N equals 16,000 survey is like Christmas morning, uh, which is funny because it happened on Christmas morning. We ran it from December through January. Um, so the results are fascinating. Um, but first, I want to try a party trick. And I just wrote this talk, and I've never done it before, so I have no idea if this is going to work. So this could be cool, or it could be super embarrassing. I would like everyone to stand up if you can. So I'm going to say some things about you, and if those things aren't true, you can sit down again. So first, stay standing if you use NPM. Good. <laughs> Stay standing if you write JavaScript in a browser. You write JavaScript at work. You're concerned that maybe the open source code you use isn't always secure. You mostly taught yourself JavaScript. You didn't learn it at a boot camp or at school or anything. OK, that was all what I was expecting. Now it's going to get tricky. In addition to JavaScript, you also write PHP or Java sometimes. Still a bunch of you standing. You work at a company that doesn't really consider itself a tech company. You started using NPM less than two years ago. Still got most of you. Oh, not most of you. You're using Webpack. <laughs> and Babel. You are writing a React app. <laughs> Using TypeScript. I've still got some people. Look at all that stuff we knew about you. Isn't that cool? So there you go. We know a bunch of stuff about you. You can all sit down now. That is how much stuff we know about you. I could go down. There are a zillion other paths that I've gone down about that. But that is how much stuff we know about you. Uh, but I went through it all really quickly. So let's go back and explore that stuff a little bit. Um, as we said earlier, most people are using NPM to build websites. 70% uh, are, are also writing server-side JavaScript. Um, and 81% of you primarily use JavaScript at work. So you're not, using, you're not just doing it as a hobby project. This is the thing we run into with investors. They're like, ah, JavaScript's for hobbyists. I'm like, no, no. Everyone is doing it at work. None of this is going to be a surprise to most of you. Um, the other finding is that NPM users aren't only writing JavaScript. That was kind of a surprise. Nearly a third of you write Java. Uh, and another 30% of you write PHP, Python, C Sharp, and Go are also popular. Uh, these days, many NPM users don't really consider themselves JavaScript devs at all. They use NPM to get stuff done, and they write some JavaScript, but they consider themselves primarily some other kind of developer. And JavaScript is just this thing that they do because you need to build a website, and how do you build a website without writing JavaScript? Um, so that was surprising, but it probably shouldn't have been. Um, because we know that the programming language that you pick is determined primarily by the libraries available in that language. And the reason we know that is because somebody did an academic study about it. And he was like, is it, you know, why do people pick programming languages? Is it, is it like the language features? Is it performance? Is it the language that they're already familiar with? Is it, you know, the thing that their office picks for them? No. The primary predictor of what programming language you use is, is there a library? in this language that will help me do the specific thing that I'm trying to get done. Because we're lazy. It turns out that laziness is our primary predictor. It turns out that we will do whatever we, what, whatever we ha can to not have to write some code as programmers. Um, 
And that's exactly what the data says. People are picking JavaScript because the libraries in NPM get, help them get stuff done. There are 750,000 libraries in the NPM registry now. And so that is an enormous number of things that can help you get stuff done. So you would expect that 750,000 libraries would have people bending over backwards to be able to use them. And that's exactly what we're seeing, right? There's this huge pile of tooling and these annoying frameworks that you have to put up with. And you are putting up with them because delicious, delicious libraries are just sitting there waiting to be incorporated so you don't have to write anything. Uh, my favorite part of this is there's a sad 15% of people who say they don't get to choose what programming language they use. Those people are mostly Ruby developers, it turns out. <laughs> Uh, another important finding is how big, a, uh, how big a concern security is to most users in the, of the registry. 77% uh, said it was, and even more concerningly, 52% of people said that the existing tools for testing whether or not uh, the, the um, open source libraries they were using were secure were not adequate. Fifth, half of people are like, not only does this suck, I can't do anything about it. That was bad news for us. Um, so that's why we've been adding all of these, uh, all of these security features, uh, because you know, the data said that we should. Um, so now would be a good time to mention NPM Enterprise. I promise this is the only other plug in the talk. If you are a big company and you're worried about the security of your JavaScript, first off, good idea. It is scary out there. Um, and secondly, we can help you with that. Um, NPM's enterprise service will give you your own registry on your own domain. You can point everybody at it and suddenly you know exactly where all of your code is coming from and you can keep the nasties out and you can get reports about what nasties did get in, plus a bunch of other great security features. But like I said, I'm not really here to plug NPM. Another thing we learned is that 45% of NPM users also use Yarn. And the also there is important. Nearly everybody who uses Yarn also uses NPM sometimes. Very, very few people only use Yarn. Um, and that's OK. Like I said, Yarn does some excellent open source work. We collaborate with them. It's fantastic. Um, and I used to say, as long as you're using the NPM registry, and Yarn uses the NPM registry, I don't care which tool you use. I don't say that anymore. Uh, the thing that people really liked Yarn for was the speed. 71% of people who use Yarn said that the speed was the thing that brought them to Yarn, and now they are the same speed. Um, but what NPM has is two-factor auth, and it has security audits, um, and it's safer. That's what we've been putting all of our energy into this year. And so I can say, with my hand on my heart, I'm not just, you know, I am biased, but I'm not just because I'm biased. Like, NPM is a safer tool to use than Yarn, and 77% of you say that you care about that, so you should probably be using, you should probably be using NPM. Um, these links are a blog post about a company uh, that moved from NPM to Yarn and stayed in Yarn for like 12 months and then decided that they hated Yarn and moved back to NPM, and they wrote that tool at the bottom which lets you migrate a Yarn project back to NPM. If that's what you want to do, you can get these slides, you can get that link, and you can check it out. There are a few more interesting demographic facts about NPM users. One is that NPM users are mostly very new. I did that in the intros. I was like, if you've been using it for less than two years, about half of people who use NPM have been using it for less than two years, which is interesting because only about a quarter of people have been using JavaScript for less than two years. So there's a bunch of people who've been using JavaScript and are still only just finding out about NPM. NPM is still inhaling this huge wave of people who are embracing modern JavaScript. Uh, we also looked at whether NPM users tend to work at a particular size of company or in any particular industry, and we got a negative result, but if you're a statistician, negative results are also interesting. About half of NPM users work at companies less than 50 people, and that sounds big, but actually that's just the distribution of companies. Most companies are under 50 people. Half of companies in the US are less than 50 people, and that's where you work. Um, we got a similar negative result with the industry. 45% uh, of our users say that they work in tech, and the other 55% say that they don't. But what is the line for a tech company? Is Google a tech company? Because if you're asking people at Google what industry they work in, Google people work at, in advertising, uh, and they also work in media, and you know, some of them work at a car company. Uh, so what is a tech company anyway? Uh, the, the, our results there were strange. Um, so that's who we are. That's all of the information, the, the demographic stuff that I got about you. Um, but what I promised you was information to help you make technical choices. Uh, and for that, we need to look at the tools that you use. And we have a great deal of information about what tools that you use. But before I get into that, I should, I should say, 
that, that one of the things about developers is they get really passionate about their tools, passionate in a sort of good and bad way. Uh, if I tell people that their tool is unpopular and they really like that tool, they tend to get really defensive and angry at me. And I'm like, I'm just reading numbers. There's just stats on a screen. Don't yell at me. Um, I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm not saying your framework is bad. I'm just talking about relative popularity. If you want me to tell you that your framework is bad, that is what the after party is for. So before I show you these angry making graphs, let's put this in context. This is how the registry grows. I showed you this graph already. I want to show it to you again. I want you to bake it into your mind because this, these numbers are going to be weird to look at if you're not thinking about the context of a registry that grows 10% month on month for everything. The registry has grown 11,000% in the last four years. So the fact that the registry is growing means that new users are constantly showing up. There's just a fire hose of new users all the time, which means that every package in the registry grows month on month in absolute terms. Even the shittiest packages are constantly getting new users <laughs> because there's just so many new users and they're all just bumping into the walls. I'm like, oh, this thing deletes my files. That's great. I want one of those. Like, <laughs> Every package in the registry is just growing out of control. Um, see that line at the top? That's Express. Oh, wait, yeah, that line at the top, that's Express. Um, Express is bedrock to NPM. Practically everything that people build with Node involves Express. This is a graph of Express using the metric that I'm about to show you. We call this metric the share of registry. It is not how absolutely popular Express is, right? Express's absolute popularity goes like that but Express's relative popularity relative to all of the other packages in the registry is going like that because there's so many other packages in the registry right now and, re and, and Express is a really old package. Express used to be 1.5% of all NPM downloads all by itself and now it is 0.1%. 0.1% sounds like not very much but it is 4.8 million downloads a week. 0.1% of, of uh, NPM downloads is winning the lottery if you are a package author. So, it is just relatively less popular, and all of our metrics are going to use this graph. It shows how the packages are growing relative to each other, not relative to absolute number of users. So first, let's take a look at some front-end frameworks, starting with the oldest, which is Backbone. As you can see, back in 2013, Backbone was the shit. Everybody was using it. Uh, but basically, nobody uses Backbone now. And by basically nobody, I mean 250,000 people a week, right? <laughs> It's collapsed in popularity, but NPM is like this. And so 250,000 people a week are still using Backbone, despite the fact that nobody uses Backbone anymore. The thing that you can see here more than anywhere else is a pattern of how a framework dies. Very few people switch frameworks, uh, especially within the life of a project. They keep old frameworks around, and they build new stuff in the new frameworks. Uh, and then they slowly retire the old software. So, uh, Frameworks, they don't fall off a cliff, they just have a half-life. They slowly decay, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That is how packages become unpopular. Um, so nobody's writing new software in Backbone, but lots of people are maintaining existing Backbone projects. Hands up if you are maintaining an existing Backbone project. There you go, you're all at the back. Sorry about that. Uh, so now let's look at React. React is goddamn running away with the web right now. 60% of respondents to our survey said they were using, 60, were using React. 60% of NPM users, and there are a lot of you, say that you're using React. That is some huge usage and some impressive growth, but it's not runaway growth. That's the interesting thing about this graph, right? It's not going like that. It's sort of going like this. What's up with that? Why does React seem to be slowing down a little bit? Uh, is that temporary? Is it going to pick back up next year? Let's look a little bit further. Um, one obvious thing to check is whether React's growth is being slowed by people adopting Preact instead. Preact is a drop-in replacement for React, which has uh, all the same features, but is much, much faster because they dropped uh, support for slightly older browsers. Um, is Preact sucking up React users? Is that, what, is that what's going on? Um, it's certainly growing super fast. You can see that in the, in the first graph. Uh, but relative, you know, it is the red line at the bottom of the second graph. It's not actually going to be that big in, in absolute terms. Uh, so we should probably look elsewhere. Angular is an extremely popular framework. Uh, back in January, about 40% of users said that they use React. This is where my math gets hazy because about two-thirds as many 
like 60% said React, 40% said Angular, that should be about two thirds as many, but our graph doesn't say that. Our graph says about half as many people are using Angular. So who's lying? Is my graph lying or are the numbers lying? There's probably some haziness here. Lots of people who use Angular use it in enterprise environments and they have like internal registries or something. That might be why uh, Angular appears to underreport itself. Um, the Angular community certainly came up with a bunch of reasons. They were not happy with me telling them that their, pop <laughs> that their framework was not popular. Um, so I am not gonna say that, certainly not in public ever again. Um, <laughs> I don't actually have enough data to be sure of that because all I have is this graph of downloads and that's not reliable. What I do have is one data point of asking people and next year I can ask people again. So next year I will know for sure because either more or less people will tell me that they're using Angular. But right now all I can say is that downloads peaked in 2017 and are beginning a slow decline. Ember is an unusual story. Ember was pretty popular in 2015 and then it had sort of a rough patch. Uh, but in 2017 and 2018 it's making a comeback. And that's unusual. I've never seen a framework do that before. I've never seen a framework turn around the decline. That's strange. It's unusual. Um, but it's seeing some really healthy growth now. In January, about 4% of NPM users reported using uh, uh, Ember. But now you can expect that number to be about double that, about 8%. Roughly as popular as Ember right now is Vue. But Vue has a very different growth story. Vue is just taking off. Uh, so if I had to guess, why is React growth slowing down? I'd say it looks like it's going to view. I think that's probably where the, where the, the newbies are going. Um, I don't have a perfect picture. There are a zillion other frameworks that could be doing this, but this is what it looks like to me right now. Does this data suggest some technical choices for you? I think it probably does, but I'm not going to get into them right now. Instead, I'm going to go into some more data, and we're going to do the predictions all at the end. So let's talk about the React ecosystem. React is a way of making components that share state. There are a lot of applications uh, that do that kind of stuff uh, and we use React to do it. There's like mobile apps and desktop apps and rich web apps. Um, but uh, rich web apps have uh, an additional requirement, which is that they need to map URLs to specific pieces of functionality. If you're building a mobile app in React, you don't need to do that. If you're building a web app, you do. So React Router is a separate package that lets you do the routing. Um, and much like React itself, React Router grew quickly and has now leveled off. But the interesting thing there is that React Router has about half as many users as React itself because the two are decoupled. And it is one of the triumphs of React that they managed to successfully decouple those functions. One of the reasons React is so popular is because the makers of React decided we are going to solve one problem only. We are going to make a really great component library about state. And we are not going to bother with all of the other stuff that the other frameworks deal with. And that means that the, cho the choices that they made when they were good got to succeed on their own merits. And the choices that they made that, they were, that were bad failed on their own merits. And they all failed and succeeded separately. Um, so React is more than twice as popular as React Router because there are lots of React apps that don't need a router. Um, and speaking of React's decoupled model, let's look at Flux. Uh, Flux was released by Facebook at roughly the same time that React was. Flux was how Facebook thought that you were going to use data in a React app. It's how Facebook uses data in a React app, and it turns out that nobody likes it. It turns out... <laughs> that the very second that there was something that could compete with Flux, people abandoned Flux en masse. Uh, and that thing is Redux. Redux, uh, as you can see, as soon as Redux started taking off, Flux started collapsing. Because it turns out people like Redux better. It's a way of managing state in your application that's more ergonomic. Uh, Redux and React Router track each other, because they're a very popular combination. They almost go up and down when they each go up and down. Um, MobX is a competitor to Redux that had a promising start, and nobody seems to care about it anymore. Um, and then there's RxJS. I confess I do not know what is going on here. <laughs> RxJS is another state management system. It competes with uh, Flux and Redux. Um, it is growing at bewildering speed. It is currently more popular than React itself. And how is that possible? How can a thing that works with React be more popular than React? Um, it's because it doesn't only work with React. It works with other things as well. The Angular CLI uses RxJS to manage state within the Angular CLI. So all of Angular's users are also using RxJS. Um, but this growth is weird. This growth is so fast for such a, pack a package that's so big that there has to be something else going on. So I'm probably going to have to do more research here. 
I mentioned GraphQL earlier. GraphQL, like RCS, started in React land and expanded. It is red hot right now. Um, there are two big libraries for using GraphQL. They are Apollo and Relay, but as you can see, Apollo is taking the cake. Apollo is the one that is taking off, and Relay is just sort of doing okay. Um, so far, I've spent a lot of time focused on front-end things because, like I said, 93% of you, um, but 70% of you are also doing back-end things. So let's talk about back-end things for a little bit. Um, over in back-end frameworks, there's really just one thing happening, which is Express. Everybody's using Express. All of the other ones don't even show up relative to Express. It's just tremendously popular. Uh, what if we took Express out of the picture? What does everybody else look like? Uh, in blue, you can see Koa. Koa is a sort of spiritual successor to Express, written by the same people who have sort of matured as developers and changed their preferences about things. Um, it's sort of bouncing along. It's not getting a lot more popular uh, in relative terms. But remember, not getting more popular in relative terms means that in absolute terms, Koa is growing like this, right? Anything that's looking flat on this graph is actually going like that in absolute terms. So Koa is doing very, very well. Um, Sales, as the name suggests, is a straight up port of Ruby on Rails to Node. As the graph suggests, this seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> um, as people get more comfortable with server-side JS, they are looking for frameworks that are more sort of idiomatically JavaScript-y, and that seems to be weighing on sales. People are not using sales as much anymore because they want stuff that is more JavaScript-y. Happy is a framework that NPM used to use. We recently switched to React for our own website. Um, and in the blog post about that switch, we made the tremendous mistake of mentioning that one of the reasons we switched is we didn't like Happy very much, um, or rather we didn't like some of the design choices made by Happy, and that made the designer of Happy very angry. <laughs> he sent me some vicious emails, oh my goodness. Uh, so I'm never gonna say that in public again. Um, <laughs> as you can see, Happy's growth is relatively flat. Uh, which means that in absolute terms, it's doing very well. Um, and then there's a bit of an oddity, which is Next.js from the makers of Zite. Next.js is a sort of kitchen sink framework for React. So if you, you, know, if you like React, but you wanted something that does everything for you, like Angular or Ember does, uh, you can try out Next. Um, so it'll set up the router and the build chain and all of the pain in the ass tooling for you. Um, and I really like this idea. So why does the graph make it look like it's not taking off? Um, it is taking off. The reason it looks strange is because Next, the package, used to be a different package. Uh, they adopted it from somebody else whose package is in decline. So if you only look at it since the Zeit guys took it over, uh, you can see that Next is actually growing really, really nicely. So how is everybody doing so far? I've just been throwing numbers and graphs at you for 20 minutes now. Uh, is everyone doing OK? Excellent. All right, I'm going to try a thing now. Everybody on this side of the line is Team A. Everybody on this side of the line is Team B. Let me hear it from Team A. <laughs> team B. <laughs> team A. <laughs> team B. <laughs> right, I'm not going to use that for anything. It's just to wake you up. <laughs> so I talked a ton about frameworks. Uh, but a big part of what people use NPM for is to help with their build chain and their tooling. Um, like everything else, there's some fascinating data here, and I'm going to dig into it because you know I'll awake again because people started shouting, and you were like, oh my god, I should stop checking my email. People are shouting. Um, the first thing to know about tooling is that everybody hates it. Um, everybody wishes there was less tooling. Everybody wishes there was less configuration. Everybody wishes the documentation was better. People are kind of pissed off about having to do this tooling in the first place, and the only reason you put up with it is 750,000 delicious, delicious libraries. That's what keeps you coming back despite the, having to set up all of this stuff that you hate. Um, first of all, what kind of tooling do you use? 85% of us use web frameworks of some kind. Um, that's compared to the 93% doing front end, so 8% of you are just rolling your own. Good jobs. 74% uh, of us are using transpilers. 69% nice, are using linters. 67% are using bundlers, 58% are using CSS preprocessors, uh, and 58% are also using testing frameworks. So let's break that out because that is all interesting. Um, frameworks in general, not web frameworks, just all frameworks. Um, Express is, of course, at the top, then React, then the everlasting jQuery, um, followed by Angular, and then a surprise appearance by Electron. 
24% of you are building Electron apps. That is much bigger than we thought it was. Electron is being used to build desktop apps and mobile apps, and it is hugely popular. Hands up if you're using Electron for something. There you go. It's about a quarter of you. Isn't that weird? You don't think of yourself as being like this big chunk of the JavaScript community, but you're a quarter of the JavaScript community these days. Electron is a massively popular project. Um, and then there's Vue and Koa and Backbone won't die. Uh, Preact, happy, next. Hands up if you use Meteor in the room. Anyone using Meteor in the room? Once, okay. Uh, it's still there, apparently. And then Ember. Um, and now let's look at transpilers. Transpilers are tools that translate other languages into JavaScript. Um, the most popular one is, of course, Babel, which is mostly translating JavaScript into other forms of JavaScript. Um, with the big exception, which is JSX, which is JSX is not part of JavaScript, but at this point it sort of feels like it should be um, because everyone's using React and everyone's using it, and it seems to be written in JavaScript all the time. Why doesn't JavaScript have JSX as a first-class feature? Maybe the uh, standards body should get on top of that. Um, CoffeeScript is clinging on, and Elm and ClojureScript in there, but the big surprise is TypeScript. 46% of you are using TypeScript. That is much bigger than we thought it was going to be. That was a huge surprise. Half of people in JavaScript aren't writing JavaScript anymore, they're writing TypeScript. What the hell was that? I'm seeing two people with TypeScript things on their, on their shirts. You, you weren't surprised. Um, so TypeScript, for the other half of you, is uh, it's a form of sort of built-in testing. It adds types, uh, which helps large teams work together by having a sort of built-in check that you're doing things correctly. Um, Microsoft launched TypeScript with its own package manager, and the community got pissed off with them and rebelled. And they were like, just put them in NPM. We do not want to have to run two package managers. This sucks. So Microsoft took their advice, which is very new Microsoft of them. Uh, but also, like new Microsoft, they didn't ask first. They just launched TypeScript 2.0 one day and said, hey, all of the packages are in NPM now. And we were like, what? <laughs> so now, in addition to its job as being the package manager, the, the package manager for all of JavaScript, uh, NPM is the official repository of all TypeScript types, which is not a job we asked for, but thanks, Microsoft. It's cool. <laughs> we have all sorts of special logic in the registry to deal with when TypeScript decides that it's going to publish an update to the types package, and it publishes 5,000 packages in the same second. And we're like, OK. We're going to line you up and do you one at a time in your own special build queue so that the rest of NPM doesn't grind to a halt when that happens. Um, linters, as 70% of you know, are tools that will tell you if your code is nice. They will check for obvious errors, and they will flag, uh, um, they will flag or even correct coding styles for you. They're super popular. And by far, the most popular is ESLint. And you may have heard about ESLint recently. <laughs> because there was a security incident with ESLint very, very recently, like a week ago. Um, ESLint, like most open source, is maintained by a group of volunteers, and those volunteers are mostly very experienced developers with professional development habits, so nearly all of them had enabled two-factor auth on their NPM accounts, but one of them had not. One of them uh, was using a simple password, and even worse, they had used that password on another website before. That other website got compromised, and somebody got that list of compromised passwords and tried it out on NPM, and it worked. And suddenly, they had access to publish ESLint, one of the most popular packages on the registry. The thing that they did with that package uh, is they published a version of ESLint that if you downloaded and installed it, it would steal your NPM credentials so that the attacker could then publish stuff as you. This is a nightmare scenario, right? Because like, if, if the attacker can get your credentials, then they can publish packages as you, creating more compromised packages, which can then compromise more people. Could have created a runaway effect. Kind of a disaster scenario. But what actually happened is that people noticed really, really quickly. Within 30 minutes of people noticing, uh, we'd taken down the offending package, and NPM security audits were warning everybody that this was happening. Uh, and the result was that as far as we can tell, and we are still double checking very, very seriously, nobody else got compromised apart from the, the first official developer because the community landed on it so fast and so hard. And like, they took down the paste bin and they yelled at everybody, like, NPM is its own, is its own uh, immune system. Um, we also reset the login tokens of everyone prior to the incident because we couldn't tell which uh, tokens had been stolen. So all of the tokens prior to last week are destroyed. So if your builds aren't working, that's why. Uh, 
But this is why NPM is taking security so seriously. This is why I talked about all of the security features, because the bigger we get, the more assholes show up. And the more assholes show up, the more somebody is likely to do something evil and malicious just for kicks. Um, so now it is possible to enforce 2FA on a package. You can say, not only am I going to only publish this package with 2FA, nobody else who has access to this package can ever publish it unless they also have 2FA enabled. The ASLint folks would have benefited from that feature last week, but at least it exists now. Um, and you have to use the N NPM6 to do this, so that's another very good reason to upgrade. But back to our tooling stats. Bundlers are things that take your JavaScript and pack it up into a single file so that it can be delivered and run on a browser. Um, they are essential to React and the other frameworks. Um, so 67% of you are using them because, you know, 60% of you are using React, and then there's another 7% on top that are using it for other stuff. Um, <laughs> except 80% of people report themselves as using Webpack, which means that more people than know what a bundler is are using Webpack. <laughs> They didn't know how to answer the previous question, but if we asked them if they're using Webpack, they're like, yes, yes, I'm using that thing. 20% um, of you are using Browserify, and 10% are using Rollup. Uh, and finally, uh, in the stats, let's look at testing frameworks. Uh, a great deal of you are using Mocha. Uh, Jasmine is also very popular. Um, Jest is understandably popular, given its ties to React and how popular React is. Uh, but sitting up there at number three is none. <laughs> Come on. 21% <laughs> of you can't be bothered to do any testing at all. Um, surely we can do better. And that brings me to another interesting part of this data, which not only can you do better, the data says that you will do better. We first noticed this effect when we started looking into security practices. Um, and we noticed how, we looked into how developers approach security and we split them up by how long they had been a developer. And there was this really great linear progression. The longer you've been doing JavaScript, the more likely you are to care about security. And we discovered that this was true for nearly everything that people would consider a best practice. So uh, this is just comparing the most experienced group with the least experienced group. Um, there was a clear line across the groups in all of these cases. So, uh, bundling, linting, various security practices, they all increase in a nice, smooth, linear way the longer you've been doing stuff. So they all, all this says is that the more, uh, the more experience you get, the better you will get it as a developer. The data says it. The data says that this is what you do. So you will get better at security. The data says you're going to. Um, this was particularly evident in security, only about 58% uh, of the newest devs use security features of any kind, but in the most experienced group, it's 85%. Uh, and you can get yourself into the yes group by just upgrading to NPM 6, right? If you upgrade to NPM 6, you can say, yes, I use security scans because they happen every time I install, whether I wanted it, want them to or not. Um, so thank you all for being so patient. We are nearly at the end. I'm massively over time, I think. Uh, we come to the future of JavaScript. Uh, this is the part where I must make the predictions that I said that I was going to make at the beginning. How am I doing for time? Yes, I'm hugely over time. All right. Um, this is the part where you can take pictures of me standing in front of a slide where I make a prediction that turns out to be wrong. <laughs> That's what these are for. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that is what predictions are for. Predictions are for making me look like an idiot. Um, so the biggest prediction I can make, and the, and the one most likely to be accurate, is that nothing lasts forever. Backbone was once dominant, and it is now an afterthought. jQuery, which gave web development so much power. Let's all hear it for jQuery. It was wonderful. <laughs> jQuery has been superseded, which is not a thing we ever thought would happen. Any framework or tool that exists today has a heyday measured in a handful of years, like three to five. That's about how long any it any individual framework is going to stay popular. Then they're going to have this long, lingering afterlife where they slowly, slowly degrade. So don't cling too tightly to your tools. That's the first thing that you, that you can get from this. Don't be the person using jQuery in 2018 because there's so much better stuff now. Um, on the front-end framework side, it would be unwise to bet against React, certainly for the next few years. React has a ton of users, and more importantly, React has a ton of modules. As I said before, language choice is driven by the libraries available. People put up with all of this crap tooling stuff because they love the libraries in NPM, 
And React creates reusable components of, that you can use in your web app. So if React gets this right, if React fulfills the promise, like there's a, there's a uh, module in NPM built by a friend of mine called React Color. You just install it, and you've got a color picker in your app. You've got the UI and the UX and the JavaScript and everything, and it just works. It's amazing. That is the dream of React. Just download and install chunks of your app so you don't have to write them. If React gets that right, React will create the same uh, self-reinforcing cycle where you know, React, people will adopt React to be able to use these components that will make them write more components, which will make more people show up. And React will have the same kind of runaway growth that NPM did. If React gets that right, React will be unstoppable. I'm not going to predict that it will, however. It might not make it, but if it does, it will go forever. Um, and the reason I don't predict that it will is because we've already seen React is kind of slowing down. What's up with that? Um, is it Vue? Vue certainly has momentum. Um, could it just be that React, while very flexible, is not flexible enough to cover 100% of web development use cases? That might well be it. It might well be that there is no single framework that is going to be good enough to build every web page in the world in it, and that React is just sort of hitting the ceiling of how popular you can possibly be. Um, I would certainly predict that. I would certainly predict that there is no framework that is going to win. There's, we're not all going to end up writing one framework forever. But in the meantime, what should you do? Uh, React has the users, um, and that's a de big deal when it comes to picking a framework. You want to be where everybody else is because they will fix the bugs for you, they will write the tutorials for you, they will answer your questions on Stack Overflow. If that's where everybody else is, it's a safe place to be. Angular has the support of Google, uh, and it is popular in the enterprise, especially among people writing Java on the back end. Um, if Google continues to support it, it's never going to go anywhere, right? Like, it's just going to stick around forever. Um, so Angular is a safer but less interesting choice than React. Vue has the momentum. Um, it is going places. It is definitely the new hotness. Will it have the staying power? It is too early to tell. I wouldn't bet on it, though. Ember has a bit of everything. Ember has a fair number of users. It's got good corporate support. It's recently got some new momentum. I would take a look at it, and if it seems nice to you, I have no problem with you using Ember. I would not you know, recommend against you using Ember. Um, and keep an eye on Next.js. Uh, like I said, I would bet on React, and Next.js is React, but with all of the pain removed. So I think Next.js is a really good idea. Um, so if you're looking to something to get your mind around, something new to learn, I predict GraphQL is about to be huge. Um, there are whole startups are built around GraphQL. People are getting funding built around GraphQL now. Um, and it has some real advantages. If you build APIs, you should be, you should be investigating GraphQL and finding out if, if GraphQL is going to help you build that API faster or better. When it comes to bundling, transpiling, and nunting, I predict that you will do them. Um, <laughs> because as you gain experience, the data says that you're more likely to do them if you're not doing them already. Uh, Webpack seems likely to keep bundling uh, for the next little while. Um, ESLint is almost certainly going to keep its hold on linting. Uh, and Babel is probably going to be the transpiler you all use. But don't forget about TypeScript. That was a shocker. If you haven't looked at TypeScript and if you're not sure that TypeScript's for you, 46% of people seem to think it's adding some value to their lives. So it's probably worth looking at these days. One obvious question coming out of that prediction is what happens to NPM if people stop writing JavaScript? Um, and the answer is nothing, because that already started years ago, and you didn't even notice. Um, a big percentage of the modules on NPM have native code in them. So you use them in your JavaScript, but they're actually in, they're, you're downloading and installing C code, which is compiling itself. Um, a bunch of them are written in ES6, which isn't really JavaScript yet. Uh, React, is written in, is, React is written in ES6. ES6 doesn't run in a browser. React can't run in a browser by itself. It transpiles itself before it runs in your browser. And you didn't even notice that, probably, that React is written in not JavaScript. Um, and one of the most exciting developments on this not JavaScript front is WASM, or WebAssembly, to the rest of us. WebAssembly lets you write in any language, like compiled languages like C and Rust, and transpile them into JavaScript. Except it's not just JavaScript. It's not JavaScript like Babel does JavaScript. It's not just other JavaScript. It's a special subset of JavaScript that can run as fast as native code. So the promise of WASM is you can run Rust, and you can put it in a browser, and it will run just as fast if you were actually running Rust on your desktop. 
That is super exciting. That promises to be a way to give web apps native-like web performance. And the best part is that it's already here. Wasmpack is a tool from Mozilla that lets you write code in Rust and compile it to Wasm and then publish it to NPM. There are already some packages up there, some of which you might already be using, that are actually writing native code and running it in your browser and you're using it in your JavaScript without even knowing that that's what you were doing. That could be where NPM ends up going. Everybody's still using NPM, but JavaScript is no longer the language there. And that brings me to my other big prediction, which is no matter what, NP what happens, NPM is here to stay. If JavaScript stay big, stays big, or if we all end up writing Rust in the browser, whatever happens, the huge pile of delicious, delicious libraries is going to keep us on NPM. Every new system is going to be backwards compatible with the old ones, and we're not going to leave those libraries behind because they're too good. There's no way we're leaving them behind. So no matter what happens to JavaScript, NPM will still be the way that you build the web. I've been doing web development now for 22 years, and it has always thrilled me, uh, and no time less than right now. The stuff that we can do on the web is amazing and wonderful, uh, and the tools that we can use to make it are ad hoc and partially finished and kind of a mess. And my final prediction and biggest prediction is that's how it's always going to be. We remake the web so quickly that it's never done. That's how you can tell that the web is growing and popular, is that it's never stayed still long enough for us to catch up and finish writing the documentation. It's always people racing ahead where the rest of us going, oh, god, we have to use that new tool now. That's why the web is exciting, because it's never ending and it's never changing. So I hope that you stick with it for the next 22 years. And thank you very much.